Hi, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and this is my week of reading wrap up where I talk about books that I read this week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. I have a lot to talk about, so I'm just going to jump right in because there's a lot of goodness here. The first book I'm going to uh, talk to you about is just this was sublime, <laughs> exquisite, elegant, thoughtful. Uh, quietly passionate and and had deep resonance. Uh, this book is At the End of the Matinee by Kichiru Hirano, translated by Juliet Winters Carpenter. Let me show you that gorgeous cover. We meet a man. He is an older man. He is a classical guitarist, very, very famous, world-renowned, and he is is meeting uh, some fans and some people after a concert. And uh, his name is Satoshi Makino. And he in he's introduced to this woman. And this woman is uh, Japanese-Hungarian. Uh, and her name is Yoko Komine. And they develop a rapport over dinner through a conversation of understanding each other while the talk is kind of going on around them. Now, Yoko's fascinating. She's a very interesting woman. She is a journalist and she's a war journalist, a war correspondent. When she is not in Tokyo, she is in Baghdad and she has a certain amount of time that she spends in Baghdad and then she's forced to leave Baghdad to recoup someplace else and kind of deal with what she's seen and to process. And then she's allowed to go back. Uh, she is on her third tour of duty there and is is, you know, processing. She's very intelligent, very smart, and very well respected. So you have two incredibly strong professionals who are meeting later in life and connecting and finding something of meaning uh, and a little shorthand that they are not sure other people understand, but for some reason, they connect with each other. They start a correspondence and then something happens uh, to Yoko when she is in Baghdad. Now, Yoko is engaged to be married, but she's been putting it off. She's been going back to Baghdad. She's been, in essence, living her own life. Uh, and, and she cannot stop thinking about Makino. And she listens to his music while she's in Baghdad. And that helps her, calms her, and allows her to do what it is that she needs to do. I don't want to give away too much of this book because I think it's so well well worth going in without knowing any more than those details. But I found it to be thoughtful. Uh, it, there's questions about memory and time, how, how you think about and how you relate and contextualize something today impacts something that you thought in the past is, is one of the themes that, that comes up frequently. I think it's realistic. I think it's, uh, despite being, you know, these lofty characters with these amazing careers, but I found the challenges realistic. I found the uh, romance realistic. I found, uh, I found it just beautifully written, very simple, but deep, as I mentioned, and thoughtful. So if you need something like I did that's completely different and that is elegant and and sumptuous, uh, this might be a good book for you. And from there, I went to something completely uh, polar opposite. Uh, so this is Cloak and Dagger Christmas, and I wanted to listen to something on audio. And I do find that sometimes audio books, especially if it's like a cozy mystery, um, is perfect because you don't have to follow it too deeply. You can just kind of step into it and, and just kind of let it let it take you on. Uh, this was the first of a brand new series. It's called Arsenic and Adobo, the Tia Rosie's Kitchen Mysteries. Uh, and this is by Mia P. Manansala. And I, it was, it was charming. It, it did exactly what it needed to do, which was entertain, uh, introduce you to a whole cast of characters. Uh, what I liked about this is that the audio was very good. Uh, 
we have Leela and Leela works in a family restaurant. Uh, she has the best last name, Maka Pagal. I just, I love how that kind of flows off the tongue. They are uh, Filipino, Filipino ancestry. Uh, she is born and raised in, in this little town that she lives in, in Illinois. And she's come back to town after a breakup. And so she's living with her aunts and working in this, in their kitchen. And, but she had other dreams and she's kind of in this kind of way station right now, trying to figure out what her next move will be. Uh, she would love to move with her best friend to Chicago and open up a cafe there. It has always been their dream, but uh, she's kind of in a holding pattern right now. Uh, enter her ex-boyfriend uh, from high school that they kind of had a rocky breakup. He is now a food critic. <laughs> so you can guess what uh, horrible things happen from there. Uh, he comes in with his stepfather, who is a big wig in town, and proceeds to kind of boss them, boss everyone around and uh, just be kind of indignant about the food that he's eating and uh, and he's been known to leave really, really scathing uh, types of reviews of other other ethnic food restaurants in in the area. At the end of his meal, he keels over dead. And of course the cops point the finger immediately at her. Uh, it must be her, she must have poisoned him. And uh, the cops are not very helpful. They're not trying to really solve this crime. So she kind of goes on her own to solve. And one of the things I liked a lot about this is they do a tour of the other restaurants in town and find out that he's been he's been a little nefarious and doing some things that he should not have been doing. Uh, so the whole that's the setup, and you meet all the characters, and it's a charming little town. And her aunties are really fun and funny. Uh, it was it was good. It was I don't think I'm going to continue with it because I like a little bit more in my mysteries, but I did want to check it out and and kind of experience it uh, since I've heard many good things about it. But if you do want something completely light and charming, uh, this is this is something you can, you can eat very easily slip into. Then next up, I finished this book, Dark Fire by C.J. Sansom. Uh, this is the second of the Matthew Shardlick series. Look at how gorgeous that is. So I think I was talking a little bit about this last week, that this series is just phenomenal. It's a historical mystery series. We have Matthew Shardlake, who is a lawyer. He is also disfigured. He's a hunchback, and so he's single. He lives alone, but he's very, very good at his job. Uh, in this uh, series, the setup is that one of his friend's nieces has just been arrested for murder. And he is trying to help the family get her out of this conundrum and to figure out what happened. And she will not say anything to anyone. She's remaining mute and they can't figure out what's going on. He is trying to win a reprieve, but she will not communicate. She will not help him in any way. Well, Thomas Cromwell steps in from on high. Yes, the Thomas Cromwell. If you've read any of your Hilary Mantel or seen Wolf Hall or any of those PBS series, he steps in and he intercedes to give her a reprieve. But he only does so because he knows that this is how he gets help from Matthew Shardlake, who has avoided working for him because he doesn't believe in what he's doing and he recognizes that being that close to power is incredibly dangerous. So the side, so that's the main plot. The side plot that Cromwell wants him to, to look for is there's something that's, that is being rumored to be out there and it's called dark fire. And it's like an al al alchemic, alchemic reaction. Um, it's, it, it could be weaponized. It's something that can be weaponized. There's rumors that it exists. It's this material that is incredibly flammable and very, very dangerous. Now, there's a race between Cromwell and Duke of Norfolk to who's going to get it because the king wants it. So it's it, it allows Charlotte to kind of go in and meet all sorts of different people, understand the 
kind of medicine at the time and science at the time. And it was incredibly interesting. Uh, C.J. Sampson is such a great writer. This is a phenomenal series. If you have not read it, I'm really looking forward to reading the third. I think there's six or seven of them in the series. Then I wanted to continue with reading um, something that was a little different, um, but this had kind of mystery elements to it. So I thought, oh, let me let me try it. Uh, this is A Town Called Solace by Mary Lawson. There we go. And this was part of the Booker Long List. Uh, so I'd, I decided I wanted to read it when it ap appeared on that list. This had, um, if you're familiar with Reservoir 13 by John something, I'll put a I'll put his last name down, down below. Uh, this had very similar type of vibe to it. Uh, think of this as like a literary mystery uh, where the mystery is kind of a little bit in the background and it's more about how the people deal with uh, the violence and the fear of a missing, of a missing young girl. Uh, we open with Clara. And Clara is young. She's like eight or 10. And her sister Rose has run away and has disappeared for two weeks. No one can find her. And so everyone is just at wit's end. Uh, her parents are not very communicative with her, but she's incredibly astute and, and observing. At the same time that this is happening, there's a woman who lives next door, Mrs. Orchard. And Mrs. Orchard kind of has been a substitute uh, mother for her. She's someone who's kind and gentle and compassionate and who likes children. Whereas her own mother has been fighting with Rose, things are tense in the household, and Clara is just not getting the kind of love and attention that she uh, needs and deserves at this time in her life. Mrs. Orchard has a cat that Clara just absolutely adores, and so she will spend a lot of time over there ostensibly helping with the cat. Mrs. Orchard has become sick and has to go in for an operation. And she's asked Clara to watch her cat for her. And so uh, Clara takes this responsibility to heart and she's honored to be given this, this task to do. Well, one day she sees a man pull up and go into the, go into the home. And she knows that only three people have the keys. She's one of them. Mrs. Orchard is the other. And this man should not have any keys. Um, but she's so afraid of upsetting her family and and uh, that she starts to try to figure out what's going on herself. We also follow Mrs. Orchard. And so we learn about her and we learn about her in the hospital and what's going on in her mind. And as she's near the end of her life and as she's going through this operation, that's um, a bit challenging. Uh, she reaches out to someone that she cared for very deeply when he was a young boy. He was a neighborhood child, just like Clara. And they formed a really special bond. Uh, the family had moved away, but she reaches out to him and they've been communicating. His name is Liam, and he takes up the third portion of this book. So we have these rotating perspectives of what's happening. Uh, Liam is in the midst of a divorce from his wife, and and he has vague memories of this home and vague memories of Mrs. Orchard, uh, but he, it comes at a very opportune time that she has left him her home, and uh, so he he's going into this to this home and looking at, looking through things and just trying to settle for a little bit, trying to figure out what his next move is going to be. I this is. If you want a uh, character study, small town, um, secrets, and uh, coming to terms with, with things that are going on in, in the world, uh, this might be a, a good book for you. I enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was homey. It was thoughtful. And ultimately, it was exactly what I needed to kind of move out of my nonfiction November funk and, and read something different. Uh, so here we go. I, I think it was I think it was good. And I'm really happy that it was on the Booker Long List because I never would have read this otherwise. Then uh, I talked last time about this book. Uh, so this was uh, Thrones 
Dominations by Dorothy L. Sayer and Jill Patton Walsh. Um, show you this cover, a little sparkly, shiny there. I was trepidatious because Harriet Vane is one of my most favorite characters, beloved characters of literature. Uh, she is a part of, she kind of comes in in the Lord P Peter Whimsey series and becomes a, a, a key member of of that storyline. Uh, I think it starts with Strong Poison. Might be the might be the first one where she appears. It's, it kind of starts as an arc, but ends up really dominating and really bringing out the best of both characters, uh, introducing her, giving her life, but also kind of reviving and giving depth and thoughtfulness to uh, Lord Peter Whimsey, who uh, could otherwise be seen as a little bit of a dilettante and kind of you know a throwaway character. I was scared because uh, because of my love for, for Harriet Vane, but also because this was a unfinished manuscript. So Dorothy L. Sayer started moving on to some other things. She was writing, um, Dan she was translating Dante's Inferno, and she was also doing a play and some other things. But she had she had started this manuscript, and so her estate asked Jill Patton Walsh if she would take it up. And I am very glad she did. I can't believe I'm saying that because I was so I was so hesitant. Uh, this was an absolute an absolute joy. It was a joy, um, and it, I didn't feel like it was fan service. It felt natural. It felt like a true progression. I would be so curious to know what percentage was already done by Dorothy L. Sayre versus what did did um, Jill Patton Walsh add to it. But we we feature uh, we fe feature the the couple coming back from being away. There was in the last book, uh, Busman's Holiday. They had been on their honeymoon in their new home when a murder occurred, and there was a trial, all the sensational scandal, all that. So they've been away abroad. They come back, and now they're now they're really joining the family, and uh, the family. As different members of the family have something to say about about uh, Harriet. Uh, you know, she's a working woman. She's a novelist. She writes detective stories. And, uh, and yeah, they, you know, he's the Lord. Uh, and so therefore she's lady, uh, later lady Peter whimsy actually. And, um, so one of the, I, I, I felt like we were on track and it was, she was not going to let me down when there's a big uh, celebration and they're at dinner and her sister-in-law just does not like her. And so she's trying to throw wrenches in this marriage already. So she sits Peter with a bunch of socialites, uh, hoping to kind of get his eye drawn into a different direction and puts Harriet on the other side of the long table with some boars. Well, uh, he cannot be bothered with these socialites. He's 100% smitten and in love, deeply, deeply in love with his wife. And you know why? Because she's brilliant and she's so, so uh, smart and astute and, and wise. And um, so they're talking, someone asks her about uh, her next book, which is a sub sore subject with uh, his, her sister-in-law. And they said, oh, well, you, you know, you're going to have to change your name. And she goes, oh, no, I'm going to keep Harriet Vane, which just everything just about drops um, because, you know, that's so embarrassing. And and uh, they said, well, you know, your husband won't like it. And and he's like, well, what do I have to do with it? And he stands up for her and he basically defer defers in public to her. Just fantastic. Uh, and they talk, it, there's just so much, what I love about this book and all of the Dorothy L. Sayers is that she's so literary. She's so smart. There's Dunn interwoven in here, John Dunn poetry. There is philosophy. Uh, there's history. Uh, so we, there's the death of the, of the king and then the new king is, is, is put up and, you know, he's having an affair with, with the American Wallace Simpson. Uh, and all of that is, is in here. Uh, and the star and the, the rumblings of war in, in Europe. So there is a ton of depth, 
of, of the mystery that they're trying to solve, but then also just so much about them as characters and what's happening around them and her her entree into this new world where she she has servants and now she, what is her role as a writer uh before she she was propelled to write because she needed to make money now she doesn't need any money and is that how is that going to impact her ability to actually write so much so much i absolutely adored it uh i might even give this a five because I think I want to read it again. Um, it was that it was that good. So if you have been on the fence about s- stepping into the next generation of Harriet Vane, see how I, how I do it, Lord P- Peter Whimsey story. Uh, maybe maybe try it. Uh, I would love to know. Have, have you? If you're a fan of Dorothy L. Sarah, have you read any of these additional ones? I think there's three more. I would love to know your thoughts. Really love to know your thoughts. So, so comment below. Right. So that's what I read. Uh, let me tell you what I'm currently reading, and I'll go really fast with this. Continuing with *In Search of Lost Time*, Volume Four. Uh, this is *Sodom and Gomorrah*, translated by John Sturrock. I'm also listening to Budden Brooks. This is by Thomas Mann, and I'm listening to this in advance of reading *The Magician* by. Uh, Colm Tobin, because I have that on Digital Arc and I want to review it before the end of the year. That's all I have to talk about today. Um, I'm going to continue with Cloak and Dagger Christmas and maybe reading through some last minute books that I want to finish before the end of the year. But thank you so much for watching. And I'd love to know, have you read any of the books that I mentioned? What did you think? And uh, we'll talk later. Bye.